This discussion now is going to be on our water supply update. Um, many of you may have seen in the newspaper or seen on the news that uh, California, despite having had a good um, December, has reverted to unfortunate form in that we've got a very uh, uh, large deficit occurring in our water supply. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our staff. Um, I believe we have um, our, our uh, sustainability director, Dr. Helen Cox, along with Dan Drugan from the Cayegas uh, Water uh, Service, and he's the uh, manager of resources. So please, if I could turn it over to you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council members. Uh, we're here tonight to bring you a report on the status of the city's water supply. I'm joined on the dais by our Public Works Director, Cliff Finley, by our Senior Sustainability Analyst, John Brooks, and by Dan Drugan, the Manager of Resources for the city's water supplier, Cayegas Municipal Water District, and he will be making tonight's presentation. Our report tonight is very timely, as the topic is breaking news in Los Angeles today. Just this afternoon, Metropolitan Water District declared a water shortage emergency and the water use restrictions that it will place on its customers. Dan Drugan will explain to us the actions that Metropolitan took today, the events leading up to this, and its implications for the city. Thanks, Dan. Okay, great. Good evening, council members. My name is Dan Drugan, and I'm the manager of resources with Cayegas Municipal Water District. I'm actually joined this evening with our general manager, Tony Goff uh, of Cayegas, and he's sitting right here uh, in the front row. And uh, Helen is right. Today we had an extraordinary action from Metropolitan Water District where they adopted for the first time ever an emergency water conservation program for a portion, only a portion of its service area. And that includes areas that are highly dependent on state water project supplies. So I know that it's Public Works Appreciation Week, and we're gonna talk about one of the most important public works projects that has brought water here to our area in Southeast Ventura County and to the city of Thousand Oaks. What you see right here on this title slide is something that we've put forward to the community over the past year. And it's connecting Southeast Ventura County to this critical reservoir up north, Lake Oroville. And you can see the, transi the transition, this is a big change. From 2019 to now, that tentacle right there is the Enterprise Bridge. That's one section of Lake Oroville. And it looks very similar uh, today uh, to, to that image right there on the right. A little background about Cayegas Water District. We were formed in 1953 by local communities to develop a supplemental water source. You can see right there on the map on the right how we articulate uh, down here in Southern California to that small section of Ventura County. We covered the cities of Simi Valley, Moore Park, Thousand Oaks, Camarillo, Camarillo also uh, Port Wyneme, and City of Oxnard. Uh, we joined the Metropolitan Water District in 1960, so it took us some time to figure out how to best provide that supplemental water service to the communities in our service area. And so we joined Metropolitan in 1960 uh, with the expectation that we would eventually connect to the state water project. In fact, the first deliveries of state water to our service area occurred in 1972. We serve about 640,000 people within that uh, yellow shaded area. We're governed by a five member elected board and we have 70 employees at the district, many of which actually live in the city of Thousand Oaks. The water purveyors that serve the city of Thousand Oaks, many of you are already familiar with this, but to recap, uh, the three principal water agencies that serve your city are California American Water Company, the California Water Service Company, uh, both of those are privately owned uh, investor utilities, and then we have the city's own utility, the city of Thousand Oaks. And there's a small sliver of Camarosa Water District up to the north. The city is entirely dependent virtually on the state water project supplies that come through Cayegas uh, that we serve these agencies. So I wanted to really hammer this home within the first couple of slides with some key takeaways for everyone here. There are insufficient supplies to meet normal demands in the Cayegas service area this year. This is in fact the worst drought in the history of Cayegas and in the history of the State Water Project, since imported water from the system came to Cayugas in 1972. The Department of Water Resources, they are the operator of the State Water Project. 
they will provide, they're prepared to provide additional water supplies to meet critical human health and safety needs this year. We're gonna talk more about that concept later on in this presentation. But when we start taking that water, eventually, uh, there is a high probability this year of a no outdoor water use mandate for a portion of this year. As soon as potentially September and into next year, if supplies do not improve on the state water project system uh, this fall and winter. So how did we get here? This is a big change, this is a sudden change. If there's any theme here tonight, bouncing around from crisis to crisis, this will be a defining issue for Thousand Oaks this summer and for all communities that we serve in Southeast Ventura County. To talk about the State Water Project and how this works, we have the Northern Sierras. That can be imagined as the California Water Bank that serves 23 million people. The majority of that population, 19 million, reside in Southern California in the Metropolitan Water District Service Area. That snowpack accumulates in the wintertime and it runs off in the spring and summer months into large reservoirs that flow south all by gravity to the Bay Delta. You can see Lake Oroville right there and those tentacles that, that reach into the Feather River watershed. Lake Oroville is a 3.5 million acre foot reservoir. It's the headworks of the State Water Project. Lake Oroville drains into the Feather River. The Feather River eventually meets up with the Sacramento River draining into the Delta all by gravity. From the Delta, we need to pump that water south, that's the Department of Water Resources with their pumping plant, through the California Aqueduct. And you can see uh, at the terminus down there, three different branches. The coastal branch that comes into San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara counties. The west branch that comes into the northwest area of the Metropolitan Service Area, where we receive water in Ventura, in Ventura County from the west branch of the State Water Project. And then there's also the east branch that serves the eastern service areas of the Metropolitan Water District, and that's principally the Chino Basin area and the main San Gabriel Basin areas. Now, another imported watershed that the Metropolitan Water District has access to is the Colorado River and the upper Colorado River Basin. And this is partially the reason why in calendar year 2021 that the situation was not as severe because at that time, Metropolitan was maximizing the amount of water that it was importing from this watershed from the Colorado River into the service area. And in fact, last year we started a unique operation that does not occur unless it's an extreme drought to actually pump a small amount of Colorado River water into the Cayuga service area. That's continuing today. The issue with our snowpack and on the state water project supplies, this is the issue and it's climate change. Over the past 10 years, there's, there've only been two years since 2011 where the snowpack has been above average, significantly above average. What we're dealing with here is extreme variability with our water supplies. You can see the last drought under Governor Brown's tenure from 2012 to 2016, how those water years shaped up with our Sierra snowpack. And then what happened? We had record-breaking storms in 2017, busted us out of, the, out of the drought, right? And now we see that extreme variability occurring again in 2018. In 2019, another record banner year for water supply. And now in 2022, we're in the third consecutive year of an extremely dry situation for our water supplies for the state water project. Now, how does snowpack translate to water that actually gets pumped down south to Southern California? Well, that looks something like this. And so this bar chart right here shows the final state water project allocations that the Department of Water Resources announces to its state water project contractors. What we see is with this red line is the degradation of the reliability of that supply to Southern California. And that's primarily influenced by climate change. What we see actually in the history of the State Water Project on this graph is that there has never been a back-to-back -back single digit allocation of this water supply until now. We're essentially living in something that, in a period that has never been experienced before with the history of this project. So to recap, this is the third year of extreme drought. When we think of threes, this is the driest three year period on record for our state water supply. We experienced the driest three months, January through March, 2022. We've had a whiplash of a water year, right? We've seen that term in the news. A record December, the snowiest month on record, to now the driest three months in the history of California. And now that's impacting our state water supply. And on the bottom here, this chart, you can see the this is actually the lowest three-year total from the state water project system ever. Now we think about how come we didn't, how could we could have prepared for this, right? Well, the department's own lowest forecast of three of those deliveries would have been 1 million acre feet. So we're only receiving a fraction of the department's lowest modeling scenario for this system. So that tells us that our baseline modeling 
needs to be reevaluated in the future. So state water project dependent areas and what does that mean? So metropolitan water district serves 19 million people, six county service area. And this image right here shows the shaded areas that are highly dependent on this water supply. To the west, you can see Cayugas Municipal Water District, Las Virginas Municipal Water District, and the LA uh, Department of Water and Power, perhaps the, the biggest agency that will be impacted by this this year. To the east, you see the main, the main San Gabriel Basin agencies and also the Chino Basin agencies that serve that population. In total, it's about 6.6 .6 million people that will be impacted by this shortfall this year. This picture right here shows the Cayugas distribution system in red and how we connect to the Metropolitan Water District system. Just for a little more background on that, you can see Castaic Lake right there at the top of the image and how that pipeline from Metropolitan comes down to their Jensen treatment plant in Granada Hills. And state water makes its way through two parallel feeders that connect up to that single connection point that connects Southeast Ventura County to Metropolitan system right there at the edge of Simi Valley in Chatsworth. Uh, what's also happening this year, I mentioned the pumping of Colorado River water, uh, that actually occurs uh, to the east on this image right here near the, near the border of Glendale and Burbank. There's a small pump station that's pumping in a small volume of Colorado River water and that only meets a fraction of our water needs here in Southeast Ventura County. So they're actually re, they're reimagining the system at Metropolitan to do that extraordinary action this year. So a little bit more about operating scenarios and how this is unfolded chronologically. The Bay Delta is a critical uh, component of this, right? I mentioned all of our water supply travels by gravity to this point, we must pump that south. So what happens in the Bay Delta during an extreme drought situation like this? Well, this was an announcement back in December 1st, 2021, the Department of Water Resources actually announced a 0% state water project allocation that we would have to plan for this year. And this image shows that they are prioritizing keeping water supplies back in Lake Oroville to flush out the salinity that's coming in from the San Francisco Bay that's fouling this estuary, this system that we need to convey the freshwater supplies south to those pumping plants and those pumping plants pump it to Southern California. So they're maintaining the water quality requirements in the Delta so we don't lose that system. That's a big problem for the State Water Project is that we have to pump the water south from this very environmentally sensitive area We've talked about a through delta solution for decades, a, a tunnel underneath the delta, a tunnel around the delta, and it has not come to pass yet. So what we see right here is in the summertime, health and safety needs. So that's water that the department is prepared to deliver to us when our state water project water supply runs out. Now when that water supply gets delivered to meet those health and safety needs, the state is expecting some very rigorous, mandatory water conservation actions that will be taken to the areas that depend on this water. That's the 0% allocation back December 1st. And then what happened? Well, we had December, right? December was the snowiest month on record. And in January 20th, the Department of Water Resources bumped up the allocation to 15%. And at the time, that was very conservative to bump it up to 15%. Now, with a 15% allocation, Metropolitan was expecting that it could meet all demands for its state water project dependent areas for the entire year with no mandatory conservation. Then we had the whiplash. Right here in December, this image shows over 19, almost 19 trillion gallons of water poured across the state. As we went through those, those next three months, essentially nothing here in February. And how this looks on a, a chart with our precipitation index here that tracks the accumulation of water supplies up in these northern uh, Sierra watersheds. That's that flatlining that you see right here from January all the way through March. So in the beginning of this water year, a water year runs from October uh, to September, we were tracking some of our wettest years on record. And then we all of a sudden flatlined and we're, and we're about to end the year below average. Now we are seeing some late season storms come in in April. We've seen the news on that, but these late season storms are not enough. We just had the driest three month period on record in California. Our watersheds are dry. Think of the dry sponge. When that water supply hits, it's not, it's not gonna come down. It's gonna get soaked up in that watershed and, and not come into the reservoirs to appreciably give us any more supply this year. And this was what led to the decision on March 18th for the Department of Water Resources to slash the allocation down from 15% down to 5%. And that is the, the, currently that is the final allocation 
that we will, rec will, will receive this year. So what happened when the allocation changed from 15% to 5%? Well, the chart on the left shows with a 15% base allocation, that's the light blue box at the bottom, Metropolitan uh, had balanced all supplies for demands that year, essentially not needing any mandatory conservation. Now with a 5%, you can see that blue box at the bottom shrinking to just a third of that base supply that we needed to get through the year. We see new boxes coming at the top of this on the right, demand reduction and health and safety. Demand reduction is pretty self-explanatory. That's the need for mandatory conservation. Health and safety is essentially water supplies that we don't have. You can think of it as welfare that the Department of Water Resources is, is giving to Metropolitan, and Metropolitan will have to actually pay that water back in future years when the system allows for supplies to be paid to pay back that water supply. When we look at this on a monthly time step, January through December, on a calendar year basis, that's how Metropolitan manages demands, we run out of the state water project 5% allocation and also supplies that Metropolitan has in storage in San Luis Reservoir, which is just south of the Delta, by May. So starting in June, you can see that tan colored uh, bar, sh bar showing up. That's the health and safety water that the state is providing to Metropolitan. That actually increases the risk of a no outdoor water use scenario if we don't conserve. You can see these white boxes at the top starting in June, the need to conserve. Those boxes are, are not supplies that Metropolitan has to meet demand. That's essentially the implementation of mandatory conservation. So health and safety water, what does, again, a little bit more on that. Um, in the state water project contract, uh, the state may allocate water supplies on some other basis to, to meet domestic supply, fire protection, and sanitation needs. Uh, there was a big effort, lobbying effort from Metropolitan early in the water year that that health and safety water supply should include some essential commercial, industrial, and institutional use. The state has since taken the position that the health and safety water supplies will not include that. In fact, it should be already included with the overall block of water that they'll be providing to us. So no, no additional increments for that supply. But there's a heavy expectation that when we start taking this supply that it excludes outdoor water use. And that's what that looks like right there. So I know this is a very sobering message right now. Now we have to triage the situation and how can we best avoid this scenario right now? And that's what the action that Metropolitan had taken today. I come back to what we just talked about earlier. Metropolitan adopted an emergency water conservation program that allows agencies to take two paths. The one path is a one day a week watering restriction for potable water or equivalent. So this is a one day a week watering mandate that will be placed on agencies and it will be up to individual local agencies and how they wanna best implement that in the spirit of meeting one day a week watering. There will have to be rigorous enforcement that we have to prove to Metropolitan to avoid surcharges. Now the Metropolitan, the, the Cayugas water rate right now is right around $1,600 per acre foot. The surcharge, if you do not meet this, is $2,000 an acre foot on top of that. Now the other pathway is a volumetric target based on population. And this is that concept of gallons per capita per day. And so all of us at home, we all have our own unique gallons per capita per day usage that we use in and around our home. Each home is different. But in a total, for our agencies, we have one population for each agency. And, the, and we have the water use for each agency. And that calculates out for a aggregate gallons per capita per day target for each agency. And so what you see right here on this bottom image is that, that those, there's a tiered structure here where you have to be beneath uh, 55 gallons per capita per day, which is the state's standard for what you should be using indoors per person. And then a small amount of water on top of that that Metropolitan has available from its normal state water project supplies. In total, that total volumetric target allocation is about 80 gallons per capita per day. Now to tie that directly back to Thousand Oaks, your current gallons per capita per day for the entire, well for this city, the city's utility, uh, not the other areas, not the investor owned areas, but your city's utility is 175. 175 gallons per capita per day. So to get from 175 to 80, you can think of that as, as more than a 50% cut in your water use, or just about a 50% cut. This is that concept again of gallons per capita per day. You can think of them as, as gallons stacked up, right? And, and how that water use makes up your use in and around the home. The outdoor water use is the biggest component of that. Now this is just for illustrative purposes only. This shows 136 gallons per capita per day. 
But of this total, that's about, you know, between 40 to 70 percent of your total use is outdoors. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to get through this with these mandatory water restrictions that are coming down? Um, we have to focus again on residential turf and non-functional turf. Non-functional turf is a very big topic right now. We've seen this in southern Nevada with how they've banned non-functional turf. And in fact, Governor Newsom, his March 28th executive order, directed the state water board, who is our water regulator, to implement a ban on irrigating non-functional turf in and around commercial, industrial, and institutional buildings. So I have an image right here of, of a potential non-functional turf area in the city of Thousand Oaks on the top right. But this is tough. This will be really difficult because with a one-day week watering mandate, mandate, we're essentially signaling to customers that we need you to sacrifice your turf to save trees. We need to save the urban canopy. We need to prioritize parks. How are we going to do that together in creative ways uh, potentially trucking in recycled water. Uh, having local agencies with their one day a week watering ordinances, uh, there, are, there is the ability to have exemptions for, for parks and for school fields. It's up to the locals and how they want to do that. But if we don't achieve the conservation goals over the next few months, we're all going to have to go to no outdoor water use anyway. And so I want to make that very clear to the city council. What did you just say? We all have to do what? So with the one day a week watering mandate, it's up to the locals, agencies, it's up to the city, how they want to handle exemptions for parks, for school fields, for areas that our community prioritizes for recreation, for golf courses, for example. But if we don't meet conservation goals on the aggregate for the entire community, the city of Thousand Oaks will still face a no outdoor water use mandate, potentially as soon as September. We're facing what kind of a mandate? A no outdoor water use mandate. New after water use. No, no, no outdoor. No, after no water use. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I, just if I may interrupt for a moment, uh, I was on the park board just recently, and we made significant reductions in the amount of non functional grass or whatever you called it. Uh, about 20% of all of the lawn uh, was removed and replaced with other things. Uh, so there, are you saying there have to be further cuts for like the our park district, would you envision? Well, we would have to work together to identify that and with, the, and with the purveyors that serve the parks directly. But what we're saying right now is with non-functional turf, the state is coming up with its definition of that. And this, these mandates that Metropolitan just adopted today will accelerate how we view non-functional turf in our communities and, how, and the need to, to ban the irrigation of that probably sooner than when those final mandates come down from the State Water Board. Thank you. So back to the presentation and Newsom's March 28th executive order. He, again, he directed the State Water Board to consider a ban on the watering of decorative grass at businesses and institutions. That's currently in development right now at the State Board for regulation. Uh, what's the difference? right? Functional turf versus non-functional turf. Well, non-functional turf are areas that, that do not have high recreational value. These are strips, usually typically, of turf uh, around your, your business parks, your, your, your different parkways that potentially might uh, need to have the irrigation stopped and completely banned at. Now, there, there could be ways where we could transfer that water, right? Or if we ban that watering at those areas, then maybe that water could be used to supplement parks, school fields, those areas that are functional. That's the purpose and goal of this executive order. And there are rebates to, to assist with this. Uh, we have a very successful turf replacement program that um, I'm sure many of you have heard about during the last drought. It was very popular to replace uh, turf grass with drought tolerant landscapes. Now with the, a one day a week watering mandate, that's challenging because it's very difficult to install a, a new landscape that, or, that has a, a watering requirement during only a one day a week watering mandate. So uh, the turf replacement program will actually postpone new plantings uh, but we still want you to rip out the turf so we can realize the immediate savings, and then we'll postpone the plantings until the water supplies improve on the state water project. This is similar to what Marin had done uh, actually last year when they were facing really strict uh, water conservation mandates uh, for their service area, Marin County. So to recap these drought actions right now, April 12th, Metropolitan, they heard an information item on the one day a week watering mandate or, or equivalent. On April 26th, which was today, Metropolitan adopted an emergency water conservation program for its state water project dependent areas that has the two pathways for compliance, one day a week watering 
or a volumetric target based on gallons per capita per day. Tomorrow night, the Cayugas Board will follow with uh, action passing through the action that Metropolitan just adopted uh, to our purveyors, to our customers, uh, to move forward with that. And then the compliance period for this, uh, to, to, for the surcharges to go into effect would be June 1st, uh, 2022. This is how this looks on an ad. We're currently developing this. Uh, we have right now a crisis of supply, but also a crisis of communication uh, because this, happened, this has all happened very quickly. And uh, we're working with our purveyors to develop advertising like this that we can put in the paper, uh, help purveyors out with messaging to the public. We're all, we're all frantically doing that right now. Also, we, we are launching a new drought response task force, and we would invite the city of Thousand Oaks to participate in this. This is something that's new. Um, we've never done this before, but the situation warrants it. And representatives from each city that Cayuga serves and large water, water agency would be included in this drought task force. And we would also include a one elected representative is our initial thinking here from each uh, city. And then also uh, the city manager if, if, or the city manager's designee uh, for this uh, drought response task force. It would be monthly meetings on Zoom. And we would talk about different ways on how we can manage through this crisis through the end of the year. Um, we'll reach out soon to the City of Thousand Oaks staff on this to see um, who, who your representatives might want, you might want to be on the, and participate on this uh, task force. And we'll start out uh, meetings uh, hopefully as soon as next month. And that concludes my briefing. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. If I might just add one additional point, as he mentioned at the end, that they are considering the uh, new measure of creating a, a, a task force. And so we are going to be back in front of the city council. This is an update briefing tonight. We'll be back in front of the city council the 24th of May. It'll be our intention at that point in time if the council wanted to make, a desig make an appointment of a designee to that task force as an elected official, uh, you'll have the opportunity to make that appointment that evening. Just a point of clarification. Uh, did you say uh, surcharges uh, for non-compliance start on July 1? Uh, June 1st. June 1st. So basically a month from now we have to cut, cut back 50%? That's correct. So, so May, you can almost think of it as being one day a week watering awareness month so that all of our purveyors can move forward with their own ordinances. Uh, it takes time to bring these forward to policy boards like, like yourself. Uh, to approve these for your city and uh, those surcharges would go into effect june 1st so we'd have to take care of our noticing to the public and everything and come up with something by june 1st that is correct and that is really why we wanted to do an update item first so this if you've seen uh, the LA Times article was uh, posted just a few hours ago before we walked in here so I can assure you uh, we're the first agency Having this conversation, uh, cities of Simi Valley, cities of Moore Park, uh, this is all forthcoming. Um, so um, it's a, a chance to really put it on the radar. I felt that was incredibly important for all of us to begin having this, this uh, discussion uh, because it is uh, a, a extremely tight timeline. We're going to be uh, providing you know our comments as this moves forward in terms of uh, timing associated with that, and our team's very actively engaged in that. One of the big challenges I think it's important to remember, and you saw it in the presentation, is that we are in the, the city of Thousand Oaks, we have three purveyors, two private companies and a public agency. It's extremely confusing for the public. Uh, oftentimes don't even know who their water uh, purveyor is. And so in this case, we're working very much to be in sync with those. And that's why we're going to be back in front of you on the 24th. A lot of groundwork will have to happen between now and then. Um, under, understood. Uh, uh, I'm the timing on this is shockingly brief. Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. A year ago this time, I spoke with our planning or our public works head is at Cliff Finley. I said, Cliff, we're heading for, towards a drought. I've got a Ben Franklin at home. My wife has a rain gauge and keeps track of it on her calendar. And you could track how we are in a drought and I said to him, why are we not conserving? Why have we not pulled the trigger last year? And he says, the question comes to the purveyors of the water, and that's Cayegas and Metropolitan, to pull the trigger on that. If my wife's tracking could pick it up, my teaching at Ventura College in the Water Science Department, where I trained some of the people in your facility, 
in the water treatment industry, I could see it. Why is it taking so long for Metropolitan Cayegas to ring the bell and bring this? It should have been done last year. Not that it's gonna be, make any difference, but in the future, we're gonna face this again. What was it that keeps you from bringing this forward last year instead of this year? Yeah, and I think I can, I can address that, Council Member uh, McNamee. So we had started off the water year tracking one of the wettest years on record, right? We had that December that blew everything away with how much snowpack had accumulated in the Sierras. The 15% state water allocation that the department had released was conservative at that time, overly conservative. The runoff projections were through the roof. But the department's the Department of Water Resources, the state operator of the State Water Project, their own modeling did not predict this. I think the best way to, to, to answer your question is we're living in a period we have never lived in before. It's a big change. It's climate change. We need to change water use habits together. We need to change out our landscaping. This is about change. We need to change together, the city, the city and Cayugas, with how we manage through this crisis in the future. And to that point, one of the things that we're doing at Cayugas, we finished up a water supply alternative study, which is a part of our long-term liability planning process as well, because we are a state water project dependent agency. So what kind of local supplies can we develop to soften and buffer this impact in future years? But that's a big change. That's a huge strategic plan change for Cayugas that has been a successful importer of state water to the city for, for over 60 years. And so we continue to do that, and we, continue, and we want to work with you on that in the future. Thank you. I've got, that's question one. I've got two more to go. We good, Mayor? Please uh, go ahead. I Thank can you. count to three. Mr. Finley, when I came on board last year as a council member, one of my big emphasis was to work with water sustainability and reuse. And we talked about running a line from our wastewater plant that I believe you and I discussed, 10 million dollars, or 10 million gallons a day of quality water goes out into a stream leaving down to Camarillo and further out, about recapturing that water and bringing it back up. And you came up with a wonderful plan working with our partners at Las Virginis. I'd like you to explain that project, but also you and I have discussed capturing that water in the Camarillo Basin there, where Camarosa is located, about collecting the water, both stormwater and what comes out of our wastewater plant. I'm looking for a vision here for water sustainability and reuse here. What do we have in the works and what can we do in the future and what are some of our challenges? So uh, thank you, Councilmember McMe. Um, the, the first thing that uh, this council had put in, put in uh, uh, put in place uh, several years back was the revitalization of the Las Robles well. And originally we were thinking we might uh, construct a treatment plant there, but uh, our neighbors, Las Virginias Municipal Water District, um, are, are building a similar desalter. And we are now working with them and Cayegas actually, um, and, and really as a, as a group, as, a, as, a, as an area, um, looking at developing that local resource and treating it in the most uh, efficient and cost-effective way. And at this point in time, we're thinking of combining that water, sending it over to Las Virgenes for them to treat in their plant, and they would then deliver it back through the Cayuga system to us as an additional local water supply. Um, that's the first, that, and that would provide the City of Thousand Oaks about roughly 10% of our, our lo as a local supply. It's, it's not, not everything we need, but that's the first step. Um, we're also looking at uh, potential diversion of stormwater into that, uh, into that same treatment facility, um, starting first on the east side of the city. Uh, that would naturally flow into their wastewater system. Um, but again, that exercise could grow uh, into future water resources throughout the rest of the city to the, to the west. Uh, the treatment plan is another is another option. Currently, the, our discharge from the treatment plant is utilized uh, to nearly 100% by Camarosa Water District. They divert that water and put it into settling basins and ponds uh, for the Pleasant Valley Water District. It's used in the Oxnard Plains and in their district. 
Uh, they're actually, in combination with the county, looking at additional projects, some additional basins that we might be able to divert some stormwater into to add additional groundwater down at that end of the basin. Again, these, these water, when, when we talk about resources, we really need to talk, talk about regional resources. Um, Camarosa is a state water um, user. City of Oxnard is. So even by us helping them get more water that they can use, uh, frees up supplies basically for the City of Thousand Oaks from, on the state water project. So we're all in this together as a county and as a region, and that's the way we're approaching it. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bilder Le Pen, I think you had questions. Thank you, Mayor Engler. Yes. Um, I'm wondering what, if apartment complexes or single family homes had gray water systems, how much of an impact would that make or would have they made? Um, those complexes use most of their water for landscaping, or a lot of them do. The HOAs in particular tend to have a lot of turf grass, and actually they'll be one of the first uh, entities that we'll be reaching out to. Um, in terms of gray water, it depends on the size of the system. If you're talking about putting it for a complete multifamily Development, I think the challenge is for existing developments, they don't have dual plumbing, so there isn't really an easy way of capturing that water. It's a different question with new developments. You could dual plumb a new development. Uh, the, the challenge is that it adds quite a bit of cost. Not only do they have to collect and recirculate the water, there are strict health and safety requirements on the treatment of that water. So it's a feasible option for new development, but it's not really, it's sort of cost prohibitive or it, it's just too difficult to do with existing developments because of the plumbing requirements. And, and oh. just to add, add one more thing there, um, your multifamily residences, your townhomes uh, and apartments, as far as indoor water use, they're using um, actually probably less than 25% of the typical water use of a single family home. It, they're very, very efficient and low. And that would be my segue into enforcement. If the average household use is anywhere from 8 to 14, 15 CCFs, and we have estates or single family home properties that use 500 and more, how are we going to enforce that? Are we going to be proactive, reactive? Are we going to see neighbor turning each other in? or how will that be enforced? And Mr. Dugan did, did speak about enforcement. How will that look like? Well, uh, the details are gonna be brought back to you on the 24th, but in general terms, um, the enforcement is gonna be first education. Uh, we are actually uh, developing door hangers now and we are going to have our staff uh, the next time they drive by, in fact, following, starting next week, when they drive by a residence and they see water uh, flowing off the residence, they're going to give them a door hanger and say, hey, you guys, we need to be conserving water. Please fix your sprinklers. Please know that this one day a week watering is coming. You can't water. You're not going to be able to water your turf as often anymore. Um, so we're gonna to try to educate people, remind people that it's time, that's what the month of May is about. It's a warning month. Um, and by the time we get to June, we will need to be actively enforcing through our ordinance requirements, which. Um, yeah, but do we have the personnel to do that? Well, we are going to have to allocate the personnel to do that. And uh, we may come back uh, and request to contract additional services. Um, we, we need to be successful at this, at this uh, conservation effort, obviously. Uh, the fines are substantial. And uh, we, may, we may also come back to council with a potential for, for additional penalties for water wasting. Um, so there's, there's opportunities. Uh, we're, we're looking at all the op options. Again, we want to be consistent with what our other two water purveyors are doing in town. So. Uh, we'll be convening with them later this week and next to, to make sure that what, it, what they're doing, we're doing, what we're doing, they're doing 
so that our uh, so that our enforcement is similar. So just to be clear, and this, I think this is this my third question. Okay, uh, just to be clear, we will have three different task force teams or enforcement teams, one for CalAM, the other one for California Water, and one for the city driving around town and giving out tickets or door hangers. Is, is that what it will look like? Potentially, yes. And there will not be any sort of grant coming from Cayegas or MWD for the extra costs that the city will be incurring for enforcement. So, so I, I can address that question. Uh, the Metropolitan Action today did allow a certain portion of funds that we have access to from Metropolitan to help assist uh, fund, fund the enforcement. So we, there will be some funding opportunities to, to help with this. And I think your, your point is a very good one. And that's why I mentioned at the outset, being in sync is incredibly important. We have the additional complexity of the three purveyors. And so what the Dos Vientos HOA experiences the North Ranch HOA experiences and what Central TO experiences needs to be in sync. And so we're, whether that's fines and penalties, whether that's the, the number of times you receive a door hanger, we wanna be in alignment on those things. So we're gonna be working very carefully with those private purveyors. Thank you. Uh, and j just to, for, uh, I'm, I'm a little, I am more than a little frustrated with the time frame here. The time frame um, of coordinating three separate agencies with any type of, uh, luckily our other agencies are private companies which are a little more nimble than a public agency who needs uh, all the uh, um, noticing that we need to do. We won't even know what it is until the 24th because that's when we're gonna vote on it. And then we have one week to get that word out to the public. Um, th this is a, a real mountain that uh, we're going to have to climb. Mr. Jones. Yeah, the, uh, I know that three of our parks, uh, uh, two in North Ranch and Triumphal Park, use reclaimed water from Los Virginis. Is there any opportunity to expand that? I guess that's because it goes there by gravity. I mean, is there any way and I guess I'm latching onto what Councilman McNamee said uh, to uh, create more uh, tertiary treated water to go to landscaping. So I, I, let me take a stab at that. Uh, it's my understanding that that uh, those systems are uh, um, fully subscribed. In other words, there's not really any additional water that they have available, particularly in the summer. Uh, and in fact, Las Virgenes, and I assume Triumph, although I haven't heard this specifically, is is cutting back their recycled water use by, I want to say, 25% is, I think, the number I've heard. So, even cutting back the recycled? Why, cutting, would, why would they do that? Um, well, uh, currently, their recycled system in the summertime, they actually have to add potable water to it because there's more demand then they have recycled water to use. Oh, that's, that doesn't, that defeats your purpose right there. Right. It, it, it really has to do with, um, again, too much irrigation being used is what that represents because that's, that's all of their wastewater that they treat in their entire system and they can't support the recycled water demand in the summer, which is turf. If, if you could water uh, one day a week, how, how many minutes can you water? Under the city's ordinance, um, it, it, would, it would vary at the different level, but at the maximum it would be 15 minutes. But um, also depending on the level that uh, we bring or the council approves at the next meeting, um, it may only be allowed to water using low flow irrigation devices and no uh, sprinklers. Well in my case, I have a very small amount of turf, but I'd be better off if you can water for 15 minutes to do two seven and a half minutes, two different days. I don't want to get into too many fine points here, but would that meet the requirements if you could do it two days for half the time? Not under Metropolitan's. Uh, mandate no it would be That's a one kind day of a week. stupid stupid rule then 
because you get much more efficient water than if you dump your water all on in one 15-minute <laughs> episode. Well, one last question. I was in government a long time ago, and we were talking about a peripheral canal. Whatever happened to that? So I can take that one. So the peripheral canal was, was envisioned to be the completion of the state water project, right? Uh, we have this delta that is the, the pinch point of our water system of bringing the Sierra snowpack water down to Southern California. And, you know, if we had the peripheral canal, if we had a tunnel under the delta, then perhaps in those really wet years, we could have conveyed more water to Southern California to fill our groundwater basins, depleted reservoirs and other areas, but we didn't have it. And so that's, it's still on the books with the state. Uh, they're currently in the environmental review phase for a single tunnel option. Uh, under Governor Brown, you, you might have re recalled the twin tunnel uh, solution under the Delta for redundancy. And that project has since been downsized to a single tunnel, uh, which is still in review uh, right now at the state in the environmental review uh, phase. Well, I, I won't pursue this, but I think the peripheral canal if we would built it back in the 80s, it would have been much, very inexpensive to build by today's standards, and I think it would have been a big help, but, but that's... I was going to say water under the bridge, but I won't say that. Okay. I, I was going to say water under the bridge, too, but go ahead, Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. One of the things, Council, I think we need to consider here is that we have a water crisis issue going on that Looks like it's going to be up and down for many years to come, very possibly. Is that a fair statement? And yet we're looking at putting in between Kmart, the Baxter building, across the street from Amgen, 50 acres out by Home Depot off of Wendy, plus probably a few others, that we're looking at a lot of housing going in, and yet we don't have water for them. And that may be a factor that we need to start looking at to see if we need to put in housing or not enough water we can't afford to put in the housing. Right. That's a, that's a real consideration in my opinion. Second is that, Mr. Finley, I look forward to working with you on stormwater capture and reuse. I, I acknowledge the agreements we have with Calam, I believe, not it's Calam, it's uh, Camarosa, that to me, stormwater capture and reuse to take the 10 million acre, uh, gallons per day and be able to use it for Thousand Oaks use as well as addressing Camarosa can be accomplished because water sustainability and reuse I think is where we need to be at, on the immediate approach. And I think there's answers here and we have some pretty bright people in your department. High expectations, Nader. So those are some of the things I would look forward to working with and perhaps Okay, I guess you can assist us in this venture. But this is not going to work when we're putting in more housing and we're running out of water. We need to start doing some drastic measures here. So, so I just, we, do, we, do have, we do have one person online as a public speaker, so if we have any other questions. I, could, I realize I'm just saying we have one person online waiting for us to end our, our, uh, our questioning. Mr. Finley? Yeah, I, I just had one point of clarification I did want to make, and, and I think it's important. Uh, when we talk about a new development today, um, and we're talking about uh, condominiums, patio homes, townhouses, apartments, the, the typical apartment townhome uses, I mean, it uses between five and seven units of water a month. The typical uh, single family home uses 25 to 35 and on up in Thousand Oaks. So I just, I just want to make that point. Um, it's, it's all about the outdoor watering is, is what that's about. It, it has nothing to do with the number of people that live there. It has to do with the size of the yard and, and how, you, how you water it. So thank you. Council Member Adam. Oh, thanks, Mayor. Well, you probably know, if this is for the gentleman from Cayegas. Uh, Thousand Oaks is a... Uh, city loaded with thousands of single-family homes. That was the model back in the 60s and 70s. Planned communities, although there was no plan for drought <laughs> at the time these communities went in. And so, yeah, you stand on any hillside and you look out and all you see is roofs. 
So I think you said 70% of the water use is outdoors and 30 is in. Okay. So yeah, I just want to get down to the nuts and bolts. So for somebody who's living in a tract house, right, on a quarter acre, whatever it is, with tract houses all around them, they got a sprinkler system, they got a lawn, they got, you know, all the usual stuff, landscape. They've got a couple of kids, maybe. They got toilets. They got showers. What, what's the impact going to be? I mean, are these people and me included? Uh, are we are we talking about putting in drip systems? Are we talking about tearing out lawns? Uh, are we talking about what kind of conservation are we talk about inside the house? I'm trying to get to the nuts and bolts of what this is really going to mean ultimately. And and as Bob said, the time frame is so small. I'm not quite sure how we can respond quickly enough. But anyway, talk about some of the things that are going to have to happen at one of these right. tract yeah. houses that we're loaded with. Yeah. So what the, what this means for the typical average single family homeowner in Thousand Oaks that um, if you have turf, you may have to sacrifice your turf to save trees and to save the urban canopy. I think that's the take home message. You need to prioritize your one day a week watering uh, for, for the areas around your home that have high value and, and that would likely be trees. Now, if you have warm season grass, maybe on one day a week watering, it's gonna be very, very stressed. I think to get through this, through, through, this, through the fall to where hopefully we have some storms that come back in the system. Um, if you have cool season grass, it's likely going to die. It's likely going to go brown. And so I think the key message point from a lot of us that you'll see, and it's not just Cayugas, we share this problem with LADWP, with Las Virginis, those areas on the east side. It's probably gonna be let your lawn go brown. And that's probably gonna be a key message point that's gonna resonate with our, 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 our class of customers out here in Cayugas. So we're gonna have to redo our sprinkler systems. Turn them off. Yes, we would recommend that people replace turn off lawn sprinklers and put in drip systems around trees to um, preserve the trees. What about shrubs and things like, can they have drip too? They can, yes. We recommend drought tolerant and native plants because they require a lot less and can uh -huh. generally survive on once a week watering. But even the drip would be one day a week? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And also, you know, if people act now, they can take advantage of the turf rebate program. So right now, um, residents can apply for a turf rebate. They get $3 a square foot for, t um, for killing their turf, essentially removing it, and then eventually replacing it with some other drought-tolerant landscaping. And as Dan mentioned, because that replanting program is on hold right now. They don't have to replant immediately, but they do need to apply for the turf rebate while they still have turf. They can't kill the turf and then submit an application once they just have dirt there or, or dead grass. Mm -hmm. So we would really strongly encourage our residents to apply for that program, um, and it will cover essentially the cost of redoing your sprinkler system mm -hmm. to a drip system. I mean, because in the heat of the summer, watering a lawn one day a week is fruitless. Fruitless, absolutely. It's, we, we, what we really need to be doing is turn those sprinklers off because the parks need that water. Okay. And we want the parks to have water. Remember the goal is 50% conservation. Um, right. I guess the, the big difference is, like you say, functional versus non-functional. Functional is our parks, our, our baseball fields for our kids, that kind of thing. Non-functional. Our schools. Our, our schools. schools, yeah. yeah. Non-functional is a, a lawn in front of your house. Right. Hmm. Well, that's going to take some adapta ab adapting, isn't it? If that's not the mindset, but, uh, well, that's what life's all about, I guess. How about indoors? Uh, if 30% water use is indoors, what do, what do we do indoors? So, <laughs> don't take so, showers. So again, it's it's important that that your appliances are are relatively, you know, that you your showers have low flow shower heads. Um, uh, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know how many folks have uh, decided. Well, we're not in a drought anymore. Let me put back in that uh, that rain bucket shower head I had. But you know, we need to we need to put back in those low low flow shower heads if you've taken them out. 
Otherwise, you need to make sure they're there. You need to make sure your, your toilets aren't running, that you're not wasting water. Mm. Maybe you don't flush quite as much. <laughs> thank there's, you. Thank well, you. I, wanted, I went in nuts and bolts. There's, health and, there's plenty of water for health and safety. They've, okay. they've told us All that. Right. The, water, okay. the problem is our outdoor water use. That's um, if, you know, we, the council adopted conservation levels at, uh, back in the fall. Um, we, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, we will likely be recommending a level four, which is roughly, what is the uh, reduction? About 50%, 40%? 40%. 40% reduction. It has a list of restrictions. I mean, if, you, if you're looking for a guide, that's probably where we're going to come back. It's pretty close. Talks about uh, drip irrigation system only. In other words, no spray heads, mm -hmm. uh, which pretty much eliminates turf. Um, but you know what? You can keep the rest, many of the rest of your plants looking just great on drip irrigation. Mm -hmm. Those who have converted... Uh, and maybe they converted last time, um, probably just have drip irrigation. Mm -hmm. this Dr. Cox, some, Dr. Cox just has drip irrigation. Uh, so it's going to take some work on the homeowner's uh, side. It, to get it this is. Done. This is a. This is an emergency. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, Thank you. Any more questions for my colleagues? And I'll get. Uh, I'll get to this gentleman who's been patiently waiting online. I, I, get to the patient on, or the uh, gentleman online, and I can go afterwards. That'll be okay. Sorry, just force so, a habit during the whole day. We we tend we tend to ask questions during our discussion as well. So I think we can we can get to our gentleman online and um, come back to our then questions. come back to yeah. uh, our normal rote of things. Um, we do have one public speaker. We have a gentleman uh, James Scott, Mr. Scott, if you're still on. Yes, good evening. Um, thank you for, for allowing me to speak. Um, this issue that's being brought to the council's attention this evening is something I've followed over many years. I'm involved with uh, NCAT and others, National Center for Agricultural Technology. This is a constant topic about water, and I've seen, I've seen it become an issue across the country. I've been waiting patiently to see when it would reemerge. It's interesting that the water district uh, says that this is a new issue. I can remember being less than 10 years old and putting bricks in my toilet, but here we are. Um, with that being said, there was a daily allocation of 80 gallons per single family residence. I'm a, I would like to verify that that number was correct as what a target was, um, but with that, a standard orange tree at a five foot width requires 10 gallons per week. And I've got 32 trees. So city of Thousand Oaks and specifically Ventura County has some of the best agricultural land in the country, specifically designated as heritage soils by the USDA. Um, I haven't planted my squash, corn or anything else yet. So I guess the donkey and chickens are out. But my point specifically to the city council is when I called in looking for an agricultural allocation, I was told that it was not something that Thousand Oaks Water had looked into. But with the discussions that are going to go forward in the preservation of our uh, equestrian heritage or even our agricultural heritage, it's going to come to boil. With that being said, I'll close by saying I think we should keep the pumpkin fields as a park to protect the two oaks, which are now shrouded with uh, pleads to keep them from being cut down. And that uh, the council member, Mac, let me excuse me if I don't know your name specifically, but his idea of adding some type of a value add to the development that would be put at Hillcrest, I've seen it done in other places and I think that it's absolutely feasible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was our only uh, public speaker. Uh, therefore, we'll go to any any response from to those ideas from our staff, and then we'll get back to council comments and questions. So, uh, city council members, one part of that public comment that I heard was the 80 gallons per capita per day, and if that is correct, uh, that is correct. And so, the 55 gallons per capita per day is backstopped by the state, and the metropolitan only has that small increment. Uh, which is that 25 gallons per capita per day on top. And it's really intended to meet the same level of conservation that the one day week watering is. The issue with the one day week watering is there's no volumetric uh, goal or target with that. We, we're, we have to wait and see how the conservation 
accumulates when we have that in, in, in implemented in, in the city. Now that 26 shrinks, that 26 gallons per capita per day that Metropolitan has will shrink if we don't meet the conservation goals. And then essentially what we're left is that backstop of 55 gallons per capita per day. And what does that translate to, to a message? That's no outdoor water use. Very good. Any uh, council comments? Oh, yes, we have we have one from Ms. Ode Le Pena, and where I see uh, Mr. McNamee also has a comment. Thank you, Mr. M Mayor Engler. My question the is the, the supply that we have. Should we go to no outdoor watering, um, severe drought conditions? How long is that supply that we have for our region going to last? Is it about six months for health and safety? Right, so, so when that, if that situation comes to pass with the no outdoor water use and the health and safety water that the state will provide to Metropolitan and to Cayugas, that water is expected to continue through next year. Um, if we don't see the supplies come into the system, I think it's hard to say that we'll have another December like we just had this past year. And, uh, you know, we would have to see if it's going to be a, another La Nina year. If the supplies don't manifest, uh, the state is prepared to continue that, that 55 gallons per capita per day back, backstop into next year. Thank you. Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Finley, again, we're talking about functional versus non-functional greenery out la landscape. Any direction from you or anyone else on staff regarding the medians that we have that have uh, natural grass that needs to be watered, converting that over into other drought, to drought tolerant uh, plants or even into uh, rocks that I'm not real excited about as far as aesthetics, but any other options we want to look at here? So during the last drought, we removed uh, most all of, our, of the city's turf. Um, what you might see left out there is more likely uh, grass that has grown naturally, possibly over the winter. Um, one of the things the city will be doing is looking at the rest, any remaining turf that we have uh, here at City Hall, as well as there are several other monuments areas that, uh, the, the example being Lynn and Hillcrest, where there's a fairly large turf area. Um, we will be looking at how we might uh, remove that turf, stop watering it for sure, and maybe replace it with some mulch and some landscaping. Again, we have to be very careful about planting any new plants at this point in time. We'll likely put off the planting until uh, closer to the fall or winter when we might get some natural natural rainfall to help out with that, and the, and the temperatures obviously would be more favorable. Um, so we'll be doing that. The other thing I want to say is uh, the the city is stockpiling mulch. Um, that mulch is available at the library for free. We keep there, there's a bin there that's, that's we keep it full uh, or, or attempt to keep it full. Um, that is a great alternative if you're an interim alternative for an area that uh, where you are removing your turf uh, and you just want to cover it with mulch or even covering the areas where you're keeping your trees uh, with mulch because again, that helps keep the water uh, lets the water get into the roots. So uh, that's a that's a great method for water efficiency. So there, and there's all, lots of other ideas. Uh, we'll be putting stuff out in, in social media, and uh, and you can always contact the city for for uh, for for additional information. Second question uh, I have is uh, last year at the Venture County American or uh, Venture County Association of Water Agencies, they had a wonderful presentation by the Farmers uh, Bureau. And they spoke of how the farmers here in Ventura County have overdrafted their wells. And the state has come in and told them that 40% of their land is not to be planted. And leaving soil farrow is not a good way of maintaining the biology within the soil for future growth. And that's gonna really devastate this county from an agricultural standpoint. I don't have an answer for them, but that's just what we're up against, and that's what we're facing regarding decisions on water use and utilization. As far as identifying who's not complying, my, my heart goes out to the homes that have fruit trees that need to sustain themselves with water. 
Some of them are actually productive properties that actually make income on it. I really just uh, found it very, very saddening to, at the last time we went through this, many of the trees we lost here in Thousand Oaks that had to be cut down because they died, lack of water. And we're gonna be facing that again because those trees have been around 50, 60 years and they were part of our community and part of the look and feel that we love so much. So I suspect we're gonna have more trees dying as we move forward with this. And I guess one of the best ways to identify who is not complying with the uh, water restrictions for outdoor use is whoever has a green lawn is most likely the one who's the culprit. And that's just an option. And uh, I, I really am not in favor of having drones fly overhead to take a look in my backyard. And I hope we don't go down that direction. Mayor. Thank I, you. Um, go, go ahead. To yeah, Mr. I just I just wanted to respond. Um, so so, you know, we are solely dependent here in Thousand Oaks on imported water. Um, so some of the other agencies have have um, blended blended water sources. They have uh, some groundwater, some state water. Um, so uh, Camarillo being an example, they recently just brought a desalter online. So I would be I would be hoping, and I and I think again as we all talk, this is this is a countywide problem. It's a Cayugas wide problem. Uh, and as far as the the person with the fruit trees in the in their yard, you know we're all in this together. Um, you know what? If I need to kill my lawn to make sure that my my urban forest remains healthy, that's probably a better long term decision on my part. And we all need to think that way. What can we do to keep our community as beautiful as it can be and and continue to make Thousand Oaks the beautiful place that it is? And just building on the comment about trees, um, we did uh, procure a water truck we um, during the last uh, uh, drought, and we did that kind of specific to some of the points you're making. We actually use reclaimed water and truck that water in through specific to some of those those critical trees and uh, we've already had conversations about ensuring that that continues forward it, yeah we have to make sure at least our our heritage trees are uh, survive through this I know in the last drought I lost uh, many of my my decorative trees but um, that was because of the drought um, Ms. Pilbelepeña Thank you, uh, Mayor Engler. My question is, what do cities do with the municipal golf courses? So, uh, again, um, there's gonna be cutbacks everywhere on water use, um, but at least I consider our, go our public golf courses, um, recreation, active turf, they're used actually every day, all day. So we'll have discussions about uh, what sort of water they may be able to use. Um, our stage four uh, drought conditions actually has a one day um, exception for parks and active play sites. So again, it comes down to can we achieve the conservation as a community that we need to achieve? And if we can do that, then I don't think uh, Cayugas or Metropolitan or anybody else is gonna care uh, if we water our, our golf course one day a week or two days a week as long as we've reduced our overall water use and purchasing from Cayugas. Now, is the city as a purveyor going to look at each household's water usage to see that they have reduced it by 50%? Because if someone is using water now, 500 plus CCFs and reducing it to 250, that's still, still astoundingly much, much more than the average household. So what do we do in that case? So we will be um, targeting our outreach efforts and really trying to drive people to uh, either one day a, a one day a week water use, or um, or that reduction down to just indoor use plus very efficient outdoor use. Currently, our tier system is designed uh, 13 units of water a month. That is designed for indoor use and some outdoor use. Again, as I stated, most of our condominiums, our townhomes they use less than 10. So 
we will, we will know who those heavy water users are and we will be working with them to try to reduce their water use down to a, an equitable level. I'll, I'll call that, it may not be 10, but it should be down to 30 instead of 300. Or 50 instead of 500? Yeah. Wow, okay. Not sure if I, I, Mr. Barron? I, I, have, I have a quick question for Mr. Finley, if you guys don't mind. Um, in terms of, um, I mean, we are looking at, I think it was $1,600 per acre foot. Is that what I remember? 1600 um, is currently what we pay. And then if we don't do our reductions, we will net a $2,000 fine for each acre foot over the amount that we're allotted. Is that right? So basically more than, more than uh, double the price. Uh, that would go, we would be the, the payer of that fine, correct? If our, if our citizens don't comply with the types of reductions, that would be required. That is correct. And, 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 and the council may choose to put in place some penalties for over, over water use or excessive water use, which could help to offset some of that cost if that's one of the action items that the council could take. We should, we, yeah, I, I, I hope we are able to discuss that uh, when you come back to us. Mr. McNamee. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Question I have regarding the amount of reduction conservation each home does. If a home is already being very conservative and they're, let's say, at 10 CCFs, there's not much level lower they can go in conservations. How do we handle something like that? To ask them to go to five would not work. How, how do we work this into the system for those that are already conserving, not to penalize them? Talk to me about how we can solve this. So again, I, I mentioned targeted targeted outreach and targeted enforcement. Um, that person who is already uh, efficiently using their water uh, would we we know we know how much every every customer uses, and uh, that person who is already very efficiently using water, uh, we won't we won't be we won't. I, I would not recommend, and it's, again, it's up to the council, but I would not recommend any sort of penalty for those folks that are using water efficiently. Thank you. Mr. Jones, you had a question. Yeah, uh, just two things. Number one, wh what percentage less water do drought, drought tolerant plants use over normal plants? Well, if you use California natives, you don't have to water them at all because they're the native plants that would be here if we weren't here. So, um, and then there are different levels of drought tolerant plants. I mean, the natives generally do better. If you give them a little bit of water, they'll stay, you know, in flower or greener for more of the year. But literally, you can have a native garden without watering at all. Okay. The other thing is, you know, our I know this has come on us really suddenly, at least to me, and I'm trying to just think about how to do this with our uh, residents. And uh, Al spoke about the beautiful lawns and lovely residential neighborhoods that we have, and, and we certainly do. But, but I think we need a campaign if possible, to stress the fact that we're all in this together, and that is like appeal to the patriotism or to the public spirit of our residents rather than threaten them with penalties. In other words, I think we ought to try to have a public relations campaign as we go into this period to, to in, inspire people to, to say, you know, there's nothing compared to what's going on in Ukraine, right? They're all inspired to save their country. Well, th this is a group effort of a much lower <laughs> uh, intensity and, and, you know, no danger to uh, fatalities or anything, of fatality. But I think that it, there must be a way that we can appeal to like local patriotism uh, to say we're all in this together and 
and stressing that we're doing this for the greater good of everybody and each person needs to do his part you know rather than stress you know if you do this you're going to get that penalty. I knew I know they have to know the penalties but I don't think we ought to stress that I think we ought to stress the positive contributions that everybody can make in this difficult time we're all in it together and Mr. Uh, Powers? Yeah, just to uh, speak to that, I agree wholeheartedly, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jones. You know, the key for us is going to be to ensure that that outreach campaign is done in conjunction with Cayegas and the other two purveyors so that uh, folks that live in your neighborhood that are um, uh, the Cal Water folks and folks that live in Newbury Park, the Cal Am folks are hearing the same thing. It's a ubiquitous message across the board. The other component that I think is very important is targeted outreach. And I, you've heard the team mention part of that targeted outreach. One of the benefits I think we have here is we have a rich HO, HOA tradition here in this community. And the last drought, one of the things that's not talked about very much, but I think it's very important to mention is we saw some levels of turf reduction, but not much. Most of the conservation that was achieved was because we took out what was the square footage of, it, it was an astronomical amount of turf grass in medians. Um, our golf course did a massive renovation, taking out significant amounts of turf grass, and CRPD was probably one of the single biggest sources of turf reduction, ornamental turf reduction, anywhere. And so that's why the messaging here really has to be that those entities have done their part. We have more to do here, City Hall, some of these other intersection areas to be demonstrations. But you know, the really important factor here is working targetedly with these HOAs and some of these extremely high water user, users to ensure equitability um, for those that are conserving. Well, very good. I think we have a receive and file here. Um, I don't think we need any action on it. Um, I think actually in some respects what uh, Mr. Power said earlier is a, uh, uh, a uh, benefit to us. We're the first out of the blocks to learn about this and, and all my friends in the, in the community. Um, this is gonna be a big thing coming to us and I really appreciate what Council Member Jones said. This is one of those moments where we're gonna have to pull together to make it really work. Uh, and uh, that this is the only way we're gonna get through this summer and then hopefully We'll have a nice winter next year and we'll take some of the pressure off. But going back to what um, my, my colleague, Mr. McNamee, has, has intimated on numerous occasions, um, the days of the big green lawn are, are maybe coming to an end in, in our area. And uh, I think that we have to really think about how we're gonna landscape our homes into the future. But for the immediate, per, uh, immediate next few months, we're gonna to have to pull together as a team and really make this work. So uh, I would take a um, receive and file motion if I have one. I'd like to move. Oh. Mayor, yeah. just so one quick comment if I may. We have, yes, go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to address the speaker. I think his name was Mr. Scott. He, yes. he mentioned the, uh, I think he was referring to the Oaks on the Nazarbekian property. Yes. And uh, I just wanna assure Mr. Scott that there are zero plans, no plans to touch those three legacy oaks on that property. We understand the value of those oaks. They've been there a long time and they're gonna be a, there a long time from now, so. And then the, the other, I think Mr. Finley summed that up when he said, we're in an emergency and it's starting to dawn on all of us that that's exactly what we're in and we're gonna have to work together and I just hope we can kind of temper the penalty business with also trying to work with the residents because this is a big shift in, in attitude that we're gonna have to try to accomplish here, so. But I think we can do it, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, our, our, our staff has given us a head start. Yeah. And we should take advantage of that. Yeah. Ms. Bill Lillipendia. No, I'm glad that much more attention is being given to this now. It's unfortunate that it's taking an emergency, but this is something that people in Southern California should have been doing already. And um, I turned my garden to a drought-tolerant garden many, many years ago. And, and I like Mr. Finley's proposal or idea not to punish those who are at or even below usage per household. 
And so I would not like that because I don't know if I can get any lower than what I have right now, and it's pretty, pretty darn low. So, um, but I'm in a different district. I'm not with the city, so. And, all of, and we are all in this together. You are absolutely right about that. Yes, um, hopefully we will be successful. It's a, a very small window, as we heard, and, uh, but with enough outreach and a very strong outreach, hopefully everybody will get the word. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to Caigas for your wonderful presentation. I'd like to move that we receive the report and file it. Thank you. Very good. Do we need a vote, uh, Madam Clerk, on the receive and file? Since we have a motion, yes. Very good, then let's uh, do the, the, vo the vote. Councilmember Bill Pena? Yes. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Jones? Aye. And Mayor Engler? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Very good. We have nothing else on the um, agenda tonight. Um, we have some closing comments, I think, from our city manager.